All right, how's everybody doing today? Feeling good. Good. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and begin. Uh, this is class number six. You know, through the course of the semester, we'll get to 20 is all. So we're nearly a quarter of the way through the semester already, and it feels like we just barely got started. Um, so you've just submitted homework number two. Assignment three is due on Tuesday, the 22nd of September. So now you've got uh, nearly two weeks for that assignment, a little bit less. Uh, that homework three includes uh, atmospheric pressure, manometers, hydrostatic forces on flat surfaces. And it's the third of those three topics that we briefly introduced during the lab uh, this week. For those of you who are attending the lab sessions, um, we did the hydrostatic force demonstration on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So we're going to continue rolling out some of those ideas related to hydrostatic forces, but this next homework three is due on the 22nd. Uh, today we're going to continue talking about ways of measuring pressure, and you may recall the uh, introduction of the piezometer at the end of our class meeting on Tuesday. So we'll talk about other kinds of pressure measuring devices today, uh, namely manometers, and then also discuss a bit further on atmospheric pressure variation. And uh, you had a problem on the homework that was related to that. We'll get a little bit more sophisticated and nuanced in our understanding of pressure variation. Uh, before we start talking about today's topics, any questions related to the announcements? All right, uh, I'll remind you that I do have office hours this afternoon, so if you have questions on uh, anything, please feel free to reach out. You can send me an email, you can contact me on Teams, you can send me, uh, you can give me a phone call. All the details are on the site. Okay, uh, long before there was YouTube video site, there were YouTube manometers, and uh, this is called a YouTube because of the shape of the tubing. If we just take a, a quick look back at the uh, piezometer from last class, what you remember is that it has a couple of distinct disadvantages. One being that gases can escape out of the top since it's vent atmosphere. And, uh, and so a piezometer like this is only um, practical for a liquid, but it, it couldn't be used for a gas. But I guess maybe practical is being too generous because um, it couldn't be used practically since the deflection, the H, is going to be so high for liquids. Uh, for the typical water pressure that we would see in a municipal network, we may have pressures that would be resulting in a deflection, the piezometer deflection of more than uh, 80 meters. So um, U-tubes are a better way of measuring pressure. Well, see where it says at the top, not responding. <laughs> That's how computers are working for me recently. They're not responding. You can see the rotating pinwheel. Let's see if it figures things out. OK, there we go. All's well that ends well. So these U-tube manometers are able to overcome some of the disadvantages that exist with the pizzer. And if you look at this YouTube manometer in the sketch that's on the screen there's two different shades of blue and what that's illustrating is that the fluid that's flowing through the pipe doesn't have to be the same fluid that you use to measure the pressure in the pipe and so this manometer liquid can be a separate fluid than the fluid in the pipe whereas in the case of the piezometer you're using the same fluid in the case of the manometer, uh, the YouTube manometer, that also introduces the capability of measuring uh, gas pressure. So you could have a gas flowing through the pipe and then use some separate liquid inside of the manometer. Now the principle is the same. We're still going to be using a deflection, delta H, to measure a pressure. And remember the hydrostatic equation is delta P is equal to delta H times gamma of the fluid. And so the way that we apply that hydrostatic principle to the YouTube manometer is we uh, kind of follow the path 
between a location where we know the pressure and we work towards the location where we don't know the pressure. And so say for instance here at the interface of air and whatever this manometer liquid is. So the manometer liquid could be water, it could be oil. In cases we may choose a manometer liquid that has a high density, something like mercury, because uh, mercury has a density that's 13.56 times greater than the density of water. So you can measure big pressures with a more modest deflection delta H. So that's why sometimes you'd maybe be interested in using a more dense fluid for the manometer liquid is that then you don't have to have a towering piezometer that's going to be 80 meters above the water pipe. If you have this fluid that's 13 times more dense than water, then that would cut down your deflection delta H by a factor of 13. So the process is that we say, where do we know in this system, if we're interested in finding out what's the pressure in the center of the pipe at location four, if we want to know the pressure at four, let's begin where we already know the pressure. And this is vented to the atmosphere. This YouTube manometer, um, by the fact that it's in contact with the air, and we can see that there are some uh, little edge markings that tells us the liquid level could rise and fall a bit further um, than uh, it's in, open to the atmosphere, and so the pressure here at location one is zero. In other words, it's, it's the same gauge pressure for the liquid as it is in the air. So here at location one, the pressure is zero. And then when we go down through the fluid, the pressure is increasing. If we go to the side, here to location three, the pressure is the same. Now the reason why the pressure at two and three is the same is because they're in the same elevation. And so as we go down through the fluid, of course, the pressure increases, but then when we go up through the fluid, the pressure decreases. So since two and three are at the same elevation, then that means that, and they're the same liquid. Just because they're the same elevation doesn't necessarily mean they have the same pressure because, for example, location one over here, that's going to be a different pressure than right across from it because it's a different liquid. So just one note of caution is that when you're applying the hydrostatic equation, it applies only when you're going through a continuous fluid. So location two and location three have the same pressure. And then when we go up this distance from surface three to location four, then the pressure is decreasing because we're going up through the fluid. And we have a different liquid. Gavin is asking a question here. Let me look over to that. If from 1 to 2 is a different fluid, would P3 equal P1? Um, the only fluid that would cause P1 and P3 to be equal is if it's a gas. And the reason I say that is, you know, gas has such a low density that minor variations in elevation aren't going to cause much change in a gas pressure. You know, like if if the delta H is 20 centimeters or even 200 centimeters, the air pressure is not going to change noticeably in 200 centimeters of elevation difference. But any other, if it's a liquid, the fact that location three is below location one means it's going to have a higher pressure. It wouldn't be equal. So, well, let's apply this principle of accounting you know, where we go down through a fluid, pressure is increasing. When we go up through pressure, uh, excuse me, when we go up through a fluid, the pressure is decreasing. Uh, let's say that this system is at 10 degrees Celsius. And the reason why the, the temperature is notable is if we have a specified temperature, then that's um, telling us to use the unit weight at that temperature. And uh, so let's Let's use the, the unit weight of 9810 newtons per meter cubed. If it was warmer, 
then the unit weight would be lower than that. So let's say that the gamma of water is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And it's saying here that the mercury has a specific gravity of 13.6. So now remember what specific gravity means. It means you can calculate the unit weight of the manometer liquid by multiplying this specific gravity times, <coughs> excuse me, times the uh, unit weight of water. All right, so we want to know the pressure at the center of the pipe. What I'm saying is P1 is 0. Find P2 using hydrostatic equation. P2 and P3 are equal. And then P4 is less than P3 because you go through the fluid. So all the dimensions are provided. Let's pause for a moment and uh, try and calculate the pressure at 4 using the hydrostatic equation. Kevin's got it right for P4. Can anybody confirm that they got the same thing?
Casey, you're off by a factor of 10. Let's take a look at uh, the setup here and just see if we agree on the general principle. All right, so here's our YouTube manometer, and you can see I've identified the dimensions and the locations, and so there's location one where the pressure is zero, um, and the first step is to apply the hydrostatic equation between one and two to find out what is the pressure at location two. So the pressure at two, you can see the formula here, is the change in pressure plus the pressure at one. And if we assume that the gauge pressure at one is zero because it's in contact with the air, then that means the pressure is going to increase 0.45 meters and the unit weight of the mercury is 13.6 times the unit weight of water. So gamma of mercury you can see has been calculated up here and so then that will make the uh, pressure at location to uh, 60 kilopascals 60,037 pascals that's the pressure at two so now the pressure at three since we go through this manometer liquid to go from two to three, we don't pass through any other liquid besides the mercury. And so we can just say if they're at the same elevation, then they're going to have the same pressure. So P3 is P2. And then we apply the hydrostatic equation one more time. From three towards four, it's going to be a reduction in pressure because we're going upward through the fluid. And so P4 equals P3 minus the change. Okay, so P4 is P3 minus the delta P. And the delta P is just whatever the distance is, the length of 1.83 meters, and then the unit weight of water, 9810. So we started with a pressure at the interface of 2,000. Pascals, and then we reduce the pressure by 17,952 because that is the uh, the change as we go upward through that water layer. And so, in the end, the uh, the pressure at location four is 42,085 pascals. All right, so. Any questions about uh, about this part of the example? Here's a little bit more complicated manometer. You know, it's a winding and circuitous from where we know the pressure towards the unknown that we're trying to identify. But even though it looks so much more complicated and we've got four different fluid segments, uh, the process is still the same. We apply the hydrostatic equation throughout. And uh, this question is asking, what's the pressure at location A? And what we do is we apply the principle of you start where you know the pressure. And this manometer is open to the atmosphere. And so the location that it's open to the atmosphere is right here, where the uh, water and the air have that horizontal interface. And so 
what you should do is you should number the sketch, you know, like where we have locations. If we call this location one, the interface of the air and the water, and then this would be location two, the interface of the water and the mercury. So, you know, if you've got the notes printed out, then you can uh, indicate those in the sketch in the notes. And then location three is here the uh, interface of the tree and a layer of oil. And then location four is the interface of the water and the oil. And so what we want to do is we just want to start where we know the pressure. And so the pressure at location one is zero. And then apply the hydrostatic equation. So every time you're going down through the fluid, the pressure increases. Uh, when you're going up through the fluid, the pressure is decreasing. Now, let's take a moment to look at the dimensioning because uh, frequently students will stumble on the dimensioning that's provided. So we're going to go down through 90 centimeters of water to get from location one to location two. Then we're going to go down through 60 centimeters of mercury to get from interface two to location three. And then if we go up from this interface, yeah, I guess we're calling that three, you go up from three to four, the distance there is 150 centimeters plus 30 centimeters. And so the, the net elevation gain is 180 centimeters from this interface up to the interface of the water. And then down from that interface to A, 150 centimeters. All right. So it's the same process as the previous example. Let's try it again. Let's try, uh, hopefully you've got your calculator handy, scratch piece of paper or notes. Go through we already know the pressure at one is zero. Find P2, P3, P4, and then finally P5 is going to be the pressure at the center line of that pipe. So that's going to be the pressure at location A. No, Gavin, that's not right. First find a, so P1 is zero. So what is P2? What is P3? What is P4? Yes, that's right, Casey. You've got the correct pressure for location two.
Jacob's got it. Well done, Jacob. All right. So here's this complicated manometer. And what we know is since it's open here, that uh, the pressure of the gas will be the same as the pressure of the water at that location one. And so P1 is zero. We're saying we're doing this problem in gauge pressure. So the pressure at one is zero. And uh, we just now start the accounting game as, as we go down, the pressure increases. As we go up, the pressure decreases. So we go down through 0.9 meters of water. And you can see that what I've done is I've uh, I've written it symbolically, and then I have started making the substitutions, and then uh, I've also done like intermediate quantities. I think it's a good idea to identify, you know, those intermediate quantities because as you're checking your work in an exam or you know, on a homework assignment, it's always such a great idea to double check your calculations to make sure that your finger didn't slip on the key or something like that. Um, Having those intermediate calculations will allow you to see what's going on in the problem. You know, like how much is the change, for example. So in this case, the pressure at 2 is 88.29 Pascal. The pressure at 3 is going to be higher because we're going down through 0.6 meters of mercury. And you can see up at the top, I've calculated all these preliminaries. So we start with the unit weight of the water. We determine the unit weight of the oil based on its given specific gravity of 0 0.8. Determining the unit weight of the mercury, because we know the specific gravity of that is 13.6. So we're going down through uh, 0 0.6 meters of mercury. And so that means the pressure is going to accumulate by 80,000 pascals and then I guess that gives you a pretty clear idea of why sometimes mercury is used in manometers is if you look at our first pressure increase from 1 to 2 it was only an increase of 8 kilopascals and that was across 0.9 meters of elevation difference but then the mercury had a smaller elevation difference it's only six tenths of a meter but the pressure increased by uh, 80 kilopascals. So that's a big difference. So that gives us the pressure at 3. And now the uh, pressure at 4 is going to be upward. So instead of a positive sign, both of these first two have had positive signs for the uh, increase in pressure. To find the P4, it's going to be a decrease in pressure. So the minus sign is because we're going up through the, the distance in this step to get from three to four is 1.8 meters and we're going through the oil. So thus uh, 7848 newtons per meter cubed. So then that tells us the pressure at location four. Let me zoom out a bit so we can keep an eye on the, uh, the sketch here. So we're at P4 and now we wanna go from four down to A and so that's going to be a plus because we're going downward. So pressure at A is P4 plus the difference. So the difference is an additional 14,715 uh, pascals. And so finally, uh, the pressure at A is uh, 89.5 kilopascals. Any questions from this manometer example?
could you explain one more time why um, P4 equals P3 minus delta P? Sure. Um, it's because if you look at the elevations to go from three to four, we're going to be going up through the fluid. And so when you go down through the fluid, the pressure increases. And when you go up through the fluid, the pressure decreases. And so, you know, this was a plus because from one to two is down. And this is a plus because from two to three is down. But now this is a minus because from three to four is up. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Thank you for asking that. Um, are there other questions before we move on? <clears throat> so these manometers are open to the atmosphere and they measure the difference between atmospheric pressure and the pressure at the location of interest. So in, um, you know, these are prone to some of the same disadvantages as a piezometer, you know, in that debris could get in there. Um, and we don't always need to know the pressure relative to the atmosphere. Sometimes it's useful to have a differential pressure. And so uh, let's take a look at a differential manometer. And a differential manometer is, um, you can see, connected to a pipe at two locations. So here at location one, it's upstream. The, uh, the fluid, whatever it is, it could be a gas, it could be a liquid, but the fluid is flowing through the pipe. And there's going to be a change in pressure from one to two. And we'll talk about how we calculate the magnitude of that change uh, as we get into chapter seven later in the semester. But for now, um, the thing to remember is just that pressure decreases in the direction of flow because of pipe friction. You know, the, the fluid that's flowing through the pipe is uh, subject to frictional forces at the interface of the pipe material and the fluid as it moves. And so the pressure is lower at location two. And the way that we can observe that is, um, let's say that this is a gas. And so think of it as, uh, you know, uh, air is flowing through a pipe and inside the pipe conditions aren't static. You know, the, the fluid is moving through the pipe. So we can't apply the hydrostatic equation in the main cross section of the pipe, but we can apply the hydrostatic principles inside of this differential manometer because conditions are stagnant in the inside of the tube. Inside the tube, the pressure doesn't change as we're moving horizontally. And if this is a gas, then the pressure won't change much just as we go down this little amount. Um, so what we can do is we can use this differential manometer to tell us the magnitude of the pressure difference between one and two. This is a horizontal pipe, so any pressure change is going to be uh, easily identified by the uh, deflection delta H. And so the pressure change is delta H times the difference in the uh, unit weights of the manometer fluid. So gamma M is whatever this substance is inside of the manometer. And then gamma F would be the unit weight of the fluid that's going through the pipe. And so it can be a liquid, it can be a gas. And this differentiator, uh, this equation that, that we have here, the delta P, that's only true if it's a horizontal pipe. We'll look at a more generalized equation in a moment that's true even if the pipe is inclined. But if it's horizontal, things are pretty simplified. And so, um, more generally, if it's not horizontal, then we can use this equation for the piezometric pressure. And I briefly introduced the idea of piezometric pressure in a previous class. Uh, piezometric pressure P sub Z is the pressure plus gamma times Z at a certain location. And uh, let me see if I can find the slide where we 
first identified that piezometric pressure idea. And maybe going back a ways here, but might be able to pick it out. If I search by keyword, that might be a little more successful. Yeah, here it was. Okay, so here's where we were talking about piezometric pressure previously. And so the, the piezometric pressure at any particular location is the pressure plus gamma z. And so now what we're saying as we apply it to a differential manometer is that between two locations, if you know the elevation of both of them, so if Z1 and Z2 is the same, then the pressure change is going to be measured by delta H times the difference in the um, specific weights. If it's inclined, then it's not going to be this simplified formula for delta P. We have to use the full version of the uh, change in piezometric pressure if we have a, an inclined differential manometer. Now, uh, what's happening here is this fluid is flowing through a pipe. So the fluid is going from one to two. And um, we don't necessarily know in this example whether it's water or oil, but it ends up, um, Let's see, in this example, in my calculations, what I assumed for the manometer fluid. All right, so it is water that's going through this pipe. So we have water going through the pipe and the manometer fluid is mercury. What we know is the pressure at one and uh, we want to find out what is the pressure at location two. And so what this differential manometer is indicating that there's a pressure change between one and two that is uh, not just a result of their difference in elevation. Even if the water wasn't flowing, there would be a difference in pressure between one and two. Because consider what we've just been talking about with uh, these manometers. You know, like in an example like this, anytime the fluid is at a different elevation, it's going to have a different pressure. And so it would make sense in this case of the inclined pipe that if the water wasn't flowing, the pressure at one would be higher than the pressure at two. But now, when the water is flowing, there's actually two effects that causes the pressure one to be higher than the pressure at two. The first is the hydrostatic effect, because you know here at one, the elevation is lower, so it's going to have more pressure simply because of that. But then there's also that pipe friction effect that I mentioned earlier, that the, uh, the pressure decreases in the direction of flow. And we can see from the arrow indicator that the flow is going from the left towards the right. So the pressure is decreasing for both of those reasons, and this differential manometer is going to allow us to predict what is the pressure at location to. So what we can do, let's see, I've got a question here. Uh, Gavin asks, is the friction dependent on the speed of the liquid? And yes, it is. As the, uh, as the liquid velocity goes up, then the pressure change that's due to pipe friction increases exponentially. All right. Now, um, the way that we solve this problem is we're going to apply the hydrostatic equation from 1 to 2. Remember, the hydrostatic equation has right in the name the limitation of when it can be applied. It's called the hydrostatic equation, meaning that it only applies when the fluid isn't moving. And so we can't apply the hydrostatic equation from one to two through the pipe because the water is moving through the pipe. But where we can apply the hydrostatic equation is 
through this differential manometer because conditions inside the differential manometer are static. That is, you know, it's in an equilibrium right now. Um, this manometer fluid reaches a deflection because of the flow and then it stops moving. It's not like the water is, is flowing through this small differential manometer pipe. The water is flowing through the main pipe, but here inside the manometer conditions are stagnant. So what we can do is we can say, you know, P1 is, as it gives us in the, uh, the givens, 450 kilopascals. So now let's find the pressure here down at the interface. So that is going to be uh, the pressure at this location is going to be dictated by the elevation difference. And so if it's delta Y plus delta H, and we're going down through water to find the pressure here. And then when we go from the interface sideways, the pressure is the same. And now going up, the pressure decreases. And the, the rate of pressure decrease is going to be related to the manometer. 133,000 newtons per meter cubed is the gamma. But we're subtracting out delta H of that pressure change. And so what I'm saying is we're going to assemble a, uh, a hydrostatic equation that starts with the known pressure at 2 and works through this tube and takes us to location 2. So I'll just speak through it and then I'm going to bring it up on the screen so that uh, you can see it along with the drawing. Okay, so P1 plus delta Y times gamma of water plus delta H times gamma of water minus delta H gamma of mercury minus delta Y gamma of water minus. Now parentheses around this distance, parentheses Z2 minus Z1 times gamma of water, and then all of that is equal to P2. Okay, so now I've, I've spoken it. Hopefully you were following as I talk through it. Let me bring up the uh, the beginning part of the solution just so you can see like the symbolic setup and then I will stop pause let you uh, see if you can start plugging numbers into the setup there all right so I'm going to try and make it so that we can see both the sketch at the same time that we have the beginning part of this example usually I'd use a whiteboard and write the equation on the whiteboard but are a little bit different this semester. All right, but there, there it is. Oh, showing me too much. All right, okay, so you see um, P1 is the given pressure in the problem statement it said that our given pressure location one is one. All right, the given pressure is 450 kilopascals. So 450 kilopascals plus, now we're going downward through delta Y and the gamma of the water. So the plus is down through the fluid. And then we're going to go plus delta H times gamma of the water. And so then that's the, the location from this interface down to the next. And then minus, because we go up through the mercury, so minus delta H times gamma of mercury, and then minus the delta Y times the gamma of water. So now we're up to this point on the right-hand side. So we're on the right-hand side of the manometer. We went vertically 
a distance of delta y so far. And then we go up through delta z, so the elevation change between the two and the gamma of water, and then all of that is equal to the P2. Now there's some common terms in, uh, in this full equation here. Some of the terms are gonna cancel out. For example, um, we have the uh, plus delta Y gamma of water, and here's minus delta Y gamma of water. So that cancels out. If we rearrange the terms, to uh, simplify by canceling out that expression that was both a plus and a minus. Here's what's left over. Um, we've got P1 plus delta H times the gamma of water minus delta H times gamma of mercury minus delta Z gamma of water is equal to P2. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and what I'd like you to do is solve this numerically. So in the distances, the unit weights, and uh, let's see if we can find P2. And then uh, after knowing P2, then calculate the P sub Z, that the change in piezometric pressure. And so the change in piezometric pressure means, um, you know, the P sub Z at one, minus the P sub Z at two, and here's the formula that will allow you to calculate the change in piezometric pressure. All right, so I'll pause and allow you to substitute given numbers into this formula to find out what is P2. Caleb's got the right answer. Let's look at the uh, substitutions that bring you to that. Okay. All right, so if we substitute in, then what that gets us is uh, we're starting at location one and that's 450 kilopascals. And then we went down through water, a net distance of 0.05 meters. And we went up through the mercury distance of 0.05 meters. So we had added 490 pascals going down through the water, but you lose 6650 pascals going uh, through the mercury. And then finally, we go up another one meter through the water, and that reduces the pressure by 9810 pascals. So the pressure at two is 434,000 pascals. Now, what about the change in P? That's the change, uh, that's the, the known pressure at two. So we started with the known pressure at one. Um, so how much? Did the pressure change? Well, if we calculate the, uh, I've got my calculator app on my phone here. So if the starting was 450, 
and now it's 434, then that means that the pressure decreased by 16 kilopascals. And that, that pressure change, part of it is due to the elevation difference, and part of it is because of the frictional effect. Both of those are occurring simultaneous. What the piece of pressure is going to allow us to do is identify how much of the pressure change is due only to the frictional effect. So substitute into this formula the delta H and the difference in the uh, unit weights, and that'll tell you the change in piezometric pressure. All right, um, so change in piezometric pressure. So the P sub Z is going to be the deflection delta H times the difference in the unit weights. So the total pressure change we had calculated just a moment ago is 16 kilopascals. Six of that pressure change is due to the frictional effect, and the rest is because of the elevation differences. So the delta PZ is just due to pipe friction. So this is uh, the piezometer, the inclined piezometer is a little bit tricky. What you have to do is you just have to think where is the situation static and where are conditions not static. So we can't just apply the hydrostatic equation directly between one and two. You know, if you just said, well, the pressure at two is the pressure at one minus one meter of water, that wouldn't have given you the correct pressure at two because um, you know there's more than just the elevation difference causing the pressure difference at location two. So where we can apply the hydrostatic equation is down here through the differential manometer because this differential manometer is in equilibrium. The water isn't flowing through it. It's just static. It's, uh, it's become stagnant because of the pressure difference between one and two. If the water stopped flowing through the pipe, then this deflection would settle back down and the liquid would be even again. The deflection only exists because the water is flowing. Now, um, there is a difference between piezometric pressure and piezometric head. What we just calculated was piezometric pressure, the difference in that. Um, sometimes piezometric head is calculated, and that is you just divide each term in the piezometric pressure by gamma. And so pressure divided by gamma, and then this gamma z divided by gamma will leave you with z on the right-hand side. And so uh, in case it comes up in a homework problem and it asks for the difference in piezometric pressure head, then this is the formula that you'd use to calculate the difference in piezometric pressure head. All right, here is a uh, picture of a weather balloon. And they're just right about to launch the weather balloon. That's as much helium as they're going to put in it here at the ground elevation. And uh, they intentionally put all the way. You can see that this balloon still has lots of slack in the material and the reason why is that they're going to be sending this balloon up into the atmosphere uh, presumably to gather weather data like the temperature and the pressure and the wind speed and by sending that balloon as a probe up into the atmosphere they're going to get a lot more information about what are the weather conditions aloft so they don't fill it all the way because as you know if you've ever released a balloon it gets a certain height and then it pops and so why do balloons pop if you don't give it room to expand? Well, what happens is that um, as the altitude 
is increasing, the pressure is decreasing, and so the helium that's in is going to expand as we go up through the atmosphere. And so um, that expansion means that the gas, you know, the, the gas molecules that are inside the balloon are going to be taking up more space. And the, the pressure that surrounds the balloon down here at ground level is pushing from all sides on it and kind of keeping this volume of helium in a smaller space than when it gets up above and there are fewer molecules pushing from the outside, then that gives room for the helium to spread out and occupy more of the balloon. So there's a, a difference between uh, atmospheric pressure at ground level and the pressure that uh, is up above. There's also a typical change in temperature. And through the lower atmosphere, so the, through the troposphere, there's a linear relationship between increasing altitude and a decrease in temperature. And the slope of that line is called the lapse rate. You can see here the dz to d, uh, excuse me, the dt to dz, that's saying the change in temperature with an increase in elevation is five degrees per kilometer. And since a Kelvin and a degree Celsius, since that has the same size, you know, the size of the increments is the same, then that lapse rate is also true in Celsius. It's, it's also 5.87 degrees Celsius per kilometer because that's just the, uh, the increment per increase in elevation. So if you go up on the top of a mountain, it's cold up there for a couple of reasons. It's cold because it's windy, uh, but it's also cold because as you get higher in the atmosphere, the temperature is decreasing because of the expansion of the gases. Um, I think earlier we talked about if some of you ever had experience, like if you're spraying spray paint, then the can will get cold as you spray it. Or if you're recharging the Freon in your cooling system of your car, you know, it's a liquid inside the can, the little cans that you can buy at AutoZone or Walmart or someplace. Um, when you get it from the can into your cooling system, the can will get all frosty because it's a liquid that Am I back? I think you may have just lost me for a moment there. Okay. I'm glad it reconnected. I, did, I noticed, I think, pretty quickly when it disconnected. So I, I hope that, uh, what was that, maybe 30 seconds or so that I was out? I think that the last thing you probably heard me saying is that gas is cool as you go up through the... All right. Thanks, Zach. Um, so that's what this figure is illustrating, is the adiabatic lapse rate, as it's called. Uh, it's a description of how the temperature changes as you go up through the atmosphere. Now, we can uh, substitute that lapse rate for temperature into a relationship that describes the pressure at a certain elevation. And so uh, this formula for temperature goes into the numerator inside of the brackets there. And this, is a, this will allow us to calculate the pressure at some elevation that's aloft. So the pressure at an elevation where what you'd be given in a problem like this is you'd be given the pressure at a known elevation. And then we want to find out if you go up through the atmosphere, what will be the temperature up there? And therefore, what will be the pressure at that new location? So this is the formula that can describe that. And uh, just to illustrate, there's a scene in um, one of the Mission Impossible movies where Tom Cruise is climbing up the Burj Khalifa. I've been in the Burj Khalifa a couple of times. And unfortunately, you don't get to go all the way to the top. The observation deck, I think, is only about 
uh, two thirds of the way the main observation deck. If you pay like five times as much, there's a secondary observation deck a little bit higher. But the main observation deck, um, I mean, it's still a pretty good view. You're up there. But let's just the example to ask ourselves uh, at the very top, if the structure is 828 meters tall, and it is, uh, what would be the air temperature and the air pressure up at that elevated location if uh, at the base of the Burj Khalifa, where we have measured the temperature and the pressure, we know the elevation there is 10 meters and um, we've got 30 degrees Celsius is the temperature of the gas and the pressure of the gas down there at the base of the pressure of the atmosphere is uh, 97 kilopascals. So the process here that you're going to follow is first of all to calculate the temperature aloft and that's the in of the uh, the brackets up in the numerator there and so we want to find the temperature at that elevated location then substitute the uh, adiabatic lapse rate alpha you can see that alpha is in the exponent of uh, this equation and also the r value for air is another term in the exponent so the r value just relates uh, uh, expansion of the gas it, it include takes the um, the molecular weight of the gas into account and so you know, we're saying specifically this is the not the universal R value but this is the R value uh, for the specific mixture of nitrogen and oxygen that is our atmosphere so uh, let me pause for a moment and give you a chance to calculate these two things what's the air temperature at an elevation of 828 meters and then uh, also what's the air pressure up at that elevation. Okay, the uh, question, does T need to be in Kelvin? Um, it does. And uh, the reason why is that when we substitute it into uh, this relationship, we want it to be a ratio of the temperature um, aloft and the temperature at the bottom. And so if they were both in Celsius, it would uh, throw that ratio off. So the temperature should be in Kelvin.
Anybody got the uh, temperature of the air at the top? Remember the temperature in Kelvin. Zachary's got it. Good job, Zachary. Gavin's killing it today. Good job, Gavin. That's right. That's the key to success. All right. All right, so we want to find out what is the uh, what is the pressure and the air temperature up at the top of the Burj Khalifa. So the uh, the first step of is uh, you know here is all of our given information. We know the uh, temperature at the base is 30 Celsius, so that is 303 Kelvin. And the elevation of the base is 10 meters. And if the structure has a physical height of 828 meters, then that means that its elevation relative to the sea level as the datum will be 838 meters. So Z up above is 838. We've got our alpha, which is the lapse rate. And uh, it was initially given in terms of Kelvin per kilometer, but we can also express that in terms of Kelvin per meter. So dividing that by a thousand, 5.87 times 10 to the minus three Kelvins for every meter of elevation. Okay, so if the uh, air temperature at the top is going to be 298. 0.27 Kelvin. So that's equivalent to 25.1 degrees Celsius up at the top. And so then that is going to be the T, you know, that temperature is the numerator. And so the pressure aloft is going to be what we just calculated, uh, 298 Kelvin in the numerator. In the denominator, it would be our original temperature of 303 Kelvin. So 298.27 divided by 303. So 298.27 divided by 303, that's on the inside. And then uh, this G divided by alpha times R. I just uh, decided let's find the, the result of that. You know, that exponent, when you combine it all together, we've got G by alpha times r, then uh, that will be unitless. And um, so it's the temperature ratio to the power of 5.823 multiplied by the pressure at the base. And that tells us that the pressure up above is only going to be 88.4 kilopascals. And sure enough, if you are riding an elevator to the top of the Burj Khalifa, your ears are going to pop several times. It is, it's a noticeable pressure decrease. It's the same thing as if you're driving through the mountains and your, and your ears give you a little bit of trouble as you do the elevation change. Uh, the difference being that when you drive through the mountain, it'll take you 20 or 30 minutes to gain 
that much elevation, whereas the uh, elevator ride to the top of the Burj Khalifa is only about 90 seconds. It happens really quickly. So your ears pop quick. All right, so what we've talked about today so far is the uh, manometers and the uh, differential manometer is a complicated one. Um, and in the past, excuse me, in the future, you're going to need to be able to set up that equation like I illustrated for you in the example. You know, in the example, you're going to need to be able to set up an equation like this just by looking at a picture and saying, all right, I can start where I know something and work towards the unknown. You know, that was kind of the take home message of the YouTube manometer was begin where you know the pressure and work towards the unknown. And you can't go straight from one to two in a single step because conditions aren't static there. Instead, you have to use the hydrostatic equation down through where conditions are static. So you'll need to apply the idea of differential manometers and the hydrostatic equation in future instances. And so I would encourage you to revisit this example and try and solve it again just looking at the sketch, not looking at the notes that I showed you or what you copied down as we worked through the example together, but see if you could solve this one on your own, uh, and that'll really help those concepts to sink in and take root. All right, if we just revisit these announcements, remember that the, uh, the next homework assignment isn't due until Tuesday the 22nd, so you've got some time, some breathing room for that. Um, otherwise, that's it for today. Hope everybody has a good day, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.